While my husband, Jake, was on a business trip, I was having lunch with my mother-in-law, Susan, when Jake himself called me. Something serious has happened. Actually, mom has collapsed. What? I looked up, shocked. Susan, who was sitting in front of me, also widened her eyes in surprise. So, the route back from my business trip goes past my mother's house. I'm going to head there and take care of mom. I looked at Susan again. Then, Susan put her index finger to her lips, signaling me to keep quiet about her being with me. Understanding her intention, I decided to go along with my husband's story. Is your mother all right? Should I come too? No, it's okay. Since it's come to this, I'll just say it. My mom doesn't like you. She thinks you're a wife who won't listen. So, there's no need for you to come. I see. Got it? With that, the call ended. By this time, I had already realized Jake was clearly lying. And he had something he couldn't tell me. As I clenched my fists and trembled, Susan then said, So, what shall we do now? My name is Megan. I'm 30 years old. I'm a working housewife in my second year of marriage. I work from home as a writer. I specifically write travel-related articles, leveraging my experience working at a travel agency during my single days. I met Jake through an introduction by a college friend, Kevin. Kevin had promised to introduce me to a colleague, which turned out to be Jake. Jake works for a small to mid-sized company. He's pretty ordinary except for his slightly above average looks. We dated without any issues for about two years. He proposed on my birthday, and I happily accepted. We visited my parents to get their blessing for our marriage. Next, we went to visit Jake's family. His parents were divorced, and his dad had moved abroad, leaving only his mom at the family home. I was initially nervous about meeting her, knowing that she was a self-made CEO of her own company. Nice to meet you. I'm Megan, and I'm in a relationship with Jake. Upon my greeting, Susan said, I've been looking forward to meeting you. Come in, come in. Susan said that with her youthful short hair and straightforward demeanor. Nervously, I sat next to Jake. Mom, I want to marry her. Well, if you two have decided, I won't oppose. Congratulations. Susan said that with a smile, which put me at ease. Then, the conversation turned to my job. What kind of work do you do, Megan? I'm a freelance writer. Mostly, I'm just at home on my computer. Susan's face clouded over instantly. A writer from home. Is that really okay? What do you mean? Well, isn't that kind of like a hobby? It must be unstable income-wise. That's not true. I consider it a legitimate job. However, Susan remains skeptical. But still, a steady job like being a full-time employee would be better, wouldn't it? I'm passionate about my current job. At that moment, Jake intervened. Let's just leave it at that, okay? The situation smoothed over, but Susan still frowned. While she didn't oppose our marriage, she never really understood my job. Nevertheless, our new home was about a two-hour drive from Susan's place. I figured we wouldn't have to interact with her much, so Jake and I went ahead and got married. The wedding went well. Kevin, who had introduced us, gave a speech, making it a wonderful ceremony. Thus began my life with Jake, 
which I believe was a happy newlywed life in the first year, with him helping around the house. However, as we entered the second year, Jake started coming home late, citing busy work schedules. Despite this, I supported him without suspicion. Occasionally, I met Susan, who would always suggest, why not work as a full-time employee? Why not get some qualifications? Growing tired of Susan's relentless comments, I one day said to Jake, Jake, I'm not comfortable around your mom. I respect her, but she always criticizes my job. Well, mom is from an older generation. You don't have to force a relationship. It's a relief you feel that way. He never forced me to get along with Susan or to listen to her. That was something I appreciated. One day, while I was working at home, my phone rang. It was Susan, whom I hadn't seen in a while. Hesitating at first, I answered a call, knowing I couldn't just ignore it. Hello, Susan, what's up? Megan, I wanted to talk to you about your work today. Susan, please, I've had enough. I... No, it's not that. I wanted to apologize. What? It turned out that Susan had come across an article I wrote in a travel magazine. She had researched and found out I was a well-known writer contributing to several magazines. I read your article. It was wonderful. Thank you. I'm sorry. I may have looked down on the writing profession, but now that I see your talent and how well you're doing, I'm embarrassed. I was wrong, and I'm sorry. Susan. I was surprised but also pleased that Susan had apologized. Aside from her opposition to my job, I had always respected and even admired her as a person. I felt a sense of relief as if our past disagreements were dissolving. So, to make amends, though it's not exactly an apology, I'll be in your town soon. How about we go out for lunch? Lunch? If you don't want to, it's totally okay, but I'd love to hear more about your work. No, Susan, I'm delighted. Please, let's have lunch together. And so, Susan and I agreed to meet for lunch at a restaurant in my town three days later. I wanted to tell Jake about it, but he was, as usual, busy with work and had left for a business trip the next morning. I wondered how Jake would react knowing that his mom and I had a pleasant lunch together while he was away. Surely, he would be happy. At that time, I naively thought so. On the day of the lunch with Susan, we chose a fancy restaurant, so I dressed up and headed to our meeting spot. Megan, over here. Susan waved at me with a smile, and as I approached, she apologized again. Sorry for all the trouble I've caused over your job. It's all right. Susan, let's enjoy the day together. I'm glad to hear you say that. Feel free to order whatever you like. Wow, the perks of being a CEO. I might as well enjoy something I usually wouldn't. Oh, Megan, you're such a fun person. Susan and I shared a laugh and headed into the restaurant. As we talked over lunch, I began to see the good in Susan that I hadn't noticed before. I developed a deep respect for her as a capable strong yet kind person. After sharing her divorce story, Susan said, When I got divorced, I was so grateful to have my job. It really made me appreciate the importance of money and working. It's crucial for women to work. I deeply felt that. Susan, is that why you pushed me towards a full-time job? Yes, I didn't want you to struggle if something happened, 
but I see now, Megan, you're doing great. I'm glad you understand. I'll work hard, just like you, Susan. Just then, my phone rang. Ah, uh, it's Jake. I wonder what's up? Jake's on a business trip, right? Yes. I'll put it on speaker so you can hear, just in case. I switched to speakerphone and placed the phone on the table. Jake's voice came through. Megan, listen, something serious has happened. Aren't you supposed to be on a business trip? Well, the trip finished without a hitch, but something serious has come up. Actually, mom has collapsed. What? I looked up, shocked. Susan, sitting in front of me, also widened her eyes in surprise. So, you know the route back from Mightrip goes past the family home. I'm going to head there now and take care of mom. I glanced at Susan again. Then, Susan put her index finger to her lips, signaling me to keep quiet about her being with me. Understanding her intent, I decided to play along with Jake. So, is your mother okay? Should I come too? No, you don't like my mom, right? But... It's okay. Actually, my mom dislikes you too. She thinks you're a wife who doesn't listen. So, there's no need for you to come. Is that so? Okay, I'll hang up then. And so, the call from Jake ended. I was already suspicious. He was clearly lying. It was likely about something he couldn't tell me. Could it be an affair? As I clenched my fists, trembling, Susan said, So, Megan, what shall we do now? Susan, this is about him having another woman, isn't it? Unfortunately, it looks like he has someone else. But don't worry, Megan, I'm on your side. Strengthened by Susan's supportive words, I felt ready to uncover the truth. Later, Susan and I plan our next steps. First, we should check with his company. Prompted by Susan, I remembered Kevin, a mutual friend who worked at Jake's company. I messaged Kevin, need to talk, to which he replied, can we meet after work today? So, Susan and I went to the designated bar. Kevin was surprised to see Susan with me, but after we shared everything, he finally spoke up. I checked with Jake's department. He hasn't gone on any business trip. They said he's on paid leave. Of course, he was lying all along. I was hesitant to tell you this, Megan. Kevin looked back and forth between Susan and me. Encouraged by Susan to please tell us, Kevin seemed to steal himself for what he was about to reveal. Actually, it seems Jake has been getting pretty close with a female subordinate named Maria. She also took leave at the same time. A female subordinate? Yes, and apparently, this photo has been circulating around the office. Kevin showed us his phone. Displaying a photo of Jake walking through a hotel district with a young woman. Thank you. Can I have this photo? Of course. Sorry, Megan. I felt responsible since I introduced you too, and I've been hesitant to say anything until now. It's not your fault, Kevin. By the way, do you know where this Maria lives? I... Well, I know a co-worker who might. Let me ask her. Kevin contacted a colleague right then, who informed us that Maria lived in a condo near the next station. Thank you, Kevin. You've been a big help. After parting ways with Kevin, Susan apologized sincerely to me. Megan, I'm truly sorry for my son's actions. It's okay, Susan. It's not your fault. I'll confront him with this evidence.
and I'll make sure that woman takes responsibility too. Wait, Megan, this photo alone might be dismissed as them just walking together. We need more concrete evidence. Leave it to me. After saying that, Susan called a nearby detective agency. Incredibly, Susan offered to pay for them to secure decisive evidence. This agency was renowned for conducting investigations at an exceptionally fast pace. Megan, try to find out when he'll be back. Okay, he just messaged me. He'll be back the day after tomorrow. Susan nodded at me upon hearing this. Two days later, while I was at home, Jake returned. I'm home. Welcome back. How is your mother? She's calmed down a lot. Looks like I'll need to visit her more often. Is that so? That must be tough. She said she feels lonely and wants me by her side. As Jake said this, the door to the next room burst open. Who's feeling lonely and wants you by their side? What am mom? Jake nearly collapsed in shock. Susan and I approached him together. What's this? Why is mom here? I thought you two weren't getting along. Too bad, we've reconciled. Imagine our surprise when we were having lunch and got a call saying mom has collapsed. That, that can't be. Jake was at a loss for words as I confronted him. What have you been doing these last few days, and with whom? Jake turned pale and remained silent. Seeing no progress, I finally said, Your business trip was a lie, wasn't it? It was actually a romantic getaway with Maria, right? What? No, who's Maria? Jake denied everything, so I showed him the photo Kevin had given me of them in the hotel district. As expected, Jake responded with something like this. This was just after a drinking party. We just happened to walk by. She's just a subordinate, nothing more. Oh really? Then what's this? I showed him another photo. The photo clearly showed Jake coming out of Maria's house and kissing her at the doorstep. What is this? Pretending to be on a business trip, you went on a romantic getaway and couldn't stay away from your mistress, lying to me and hanging around at her place. This photo was obtained by your mother hiring a detective agency. Mom did. I can't believe it. Jake looked at Susan in disbelief, and suddenly, Susan slapped him hard. You idiot son, having such a good wife and doing something like this, have you forgotten what caused your father and I to divorce? It was your father's affair, wasn't it? It's shameful that you only inherited that trait. Mom. I once talked about handing over my company to you. Remember, forget it. That's not all. Be prepared, because I'm disowning you. That can't be. Realizing he had no way out, Jake knelt down before me. Megan, it was just a moment of weakness. Please forgive me. I promise to be a better husband from now on. That's when I firmly told him off. Don't be ridiculous. You lied and betrayed me, and now you expect me to forgive you just like that. We're getting a divorce, and I'll be taking a fair settlement for your affair. Eck. Jake was left speechless, groaning in despair, as Susan kicked him out of the house. The divorce between Jake and me was finalized later. Susan arranged for a lawyer, and I received a generous settlement more than the standard amount for the divorce. I also demanded compensation from Maria, Jake's mistress. The affair and subsequent troubles led to Jake and Maria's breakup. Later, 
Susan generously gave me a large sum of money as compensation. She was relentless. It turned out that Jake's employment was through Susan's connections, and she told his company's president to fire him for his misconduct and disturbing company order by getting involved with a subordinate. Jake was dismissed from his job. With his savings depleted by the divorce settlement and disowned by Susan, Jake is now living in a rundown apartment, working as a day laborer without distinction between day and night, even knowing this, I feel no sympathy. Serves him right, is all I think. As for me, I moved with the settlement money and continued my work as a writer. Susan and I now address each other by our nickname, Meg and Sizzy, and sometimes travel together. There seems to be much more I can learn from her. I cherish the supportive relationship with Susan and aim to live my life positively moving forward. Out of the blue, my nine-year-old son, Nick, was diagnosed with pediatric cancer. Nick had been complaining of persistent fatigue, and while I never thought it was just regular tiredness, pediatric cancer was the last thing on my mind. From that day, he was forced to be hospitalized for tough treatments. Just being lazy, right? Trying to gain sympathy with something as far-fetched as pediatric cancer. How attention-seeking can you be? Even when I told Michael about Nick's illness, he didn't take it seriously. Despite being busy with work, he never once visited Nick in the hospital. My mill, Susan, insisting that housework is the wife's job, never lifted a finger to help and only complained. Then, one day, Susan and Michael, you had never visited before, came to Nick's hospital room. You know, cancer can be cured with vitamins, right? Excuse me. I found lots of stories online about miraculous cancer cures with vitamins. Like, stage 4 cancer disappeared in a week. So, I'll cure our next cancer. He took the orange juice Nick was drinking, threw it over his head. I'm going on a week-long spot rip with your grandma. Make sure you're cured by the time I get back. Shocked by this unbelievable event, both Nick and I were speechless. After they left, Nick burst into tears, relieved from the fear. Cure cancer with vitamins, what is that even about? And you throws liquid on a sick person, seriously. Filled with incredible anger, I decided to get back at them. Little did they know, a shocking truth awaited them a week later. I married my first husband, David, when I was 26. He was four years older and had been my tutor when I was preparing for high school. After I started working, we reconnected as colleagues. They gradually moved from reminiscing to talking about the future and got married. That's the background of the situation. The following year, Nick was born. Just as our new family began its journey, David passed away due to illness. He had felt fatigue but didn't seek medical attention due to work. One day, he collapsed at work, and upon examination, it was discovered he had cancer. He started treatment immediately, but the disease progressed rapidly, and he passed away three months later. Years later, I remarried my current husband, Michael. Initially, I worried about how Nick and Michael, not related by blood, would get along. But gradually, they grew closer, and one day Nick asked if he could call Michael dad. Surprised, Michael and I exchanged looks, but we knew this was our answer and considered marriage seriously. Our meeting with Michael's parents went smoothly, and they adored Nick as their own grandchild. 
It was Michael's first marriage, so we invited family and close friends for a wedding ceremony. You would have thought I'd have two weddings. I joked with my friends. It was a heartwarming ceremony. However, the seemingly happy in law family had its issues. Michael's younger brother, who married before us. Michael had moved out when he started working. Marriage was unthinkable, it seemed to be his favorite saying. And his serious brother-in-law decided to take over his parents and law's family, got married, and lived with them in the in-law's house. My mother-in-law, Susan, seems to be at odds with my brother's-in-law's wife, Alice, and her complaints about Alice always enter into the conversation, which made me uncomfortable. I didn't want to take sides based only on her complaints, nor did I feel right asking Alice about it. So, I mostly nodded along and ignored her rants. But this seemed to encourage her to increasingly intrude into our home. She started staying over for various reasons, and before I knew it, she was staying over half of the month, and eventually moved in with her belongings. She began acting as if she owned the place, and her attitude towards me and Nick changed. At first, my mother-in-law was kind and understanding to me and my son, she began to say sarcastic things that were not important to us. Before remarrying, I was working part-time, getting by with the help of David's estate. Even after remarrying, I continued working part-time, albeit less frequently, to contribute a little extra. Considering Nick's future, having more money is always better. However, Susan implied that my working part-time meant Michael wasn't earning enough and kept telling me to quit. After all, you're a mom and should prioritize parenting. I've never once neglected Nick because of my job. We've managed just fine together. But then, Susan started making snide remarks to Nick. You're the reason your mom struggles. Your new dad even feels embarrassed about you in public. She blamed Nick for making Michael feel uncomfortable and started forcing him to do middle school level workbooks, which were too advanced for a child in lower elementary. He hasn't even learned the basics, and she's making him do middle school workbooks. Of course, Nick couldn't answer any questions and ended up crying. She'd even take away his meals, saying his crying was annoying and that boys shouldn't cry so much. Gradually, Nick became afraid of her and started avoiding being alone with her. What an unlovable brat. He lacks cuteness because he doesn't get enough motherly love. What kind of parenting is this? She said it so that my son could hear her so my son would often say sorry and apologize to me. It must have been hard for him that I was being blamed because of him. If I confronted Susan directly, she'd take it out on Nick, so I gradually became unable to voice my opinions. But considering Nick's welfare, I couldn't stay silent. I waited for Michael, he was often away for work to come home and then shared everything about Susan's behavior. But he didn't believe me, insisting that his mother couldn't possibly say such things or treat a child badly. You say my mom's terrible, but maybe you're the one being harsh to her. What? I've heard complaints. You can handle the housework properly. Since we can live on my income, just focus on the house and stop working outside. I was baffled. I'd been told to quit my job but had never forced housework onto Susan. In fact, I had never seen her do any housework. She'd just sit around like the lady of the house ordering me around. She complained about the seasoning of meals, but I'd never had a chance to taste her preferred seasoning. How could I guess flavors I've never tried?
I'm not a mind reader. I almost spoke back many times but always held back. Fearing Nick would become her target. Gradually, Michael's attitude toward Nick and me became colder. Still, coldness was bearable. Sometimes, he'd get so angry it was as if another personality had taken over. He never hit us, but he'd throw things, sometimes hitting Nick. Once, when Nick cried from pain and fear, Michael dragged him outside, saying to stay there until he stopped crying. I shielded Nick, ready to be hit, but luckily, Michael lost interest, measuring it was a turn off. He must be stressed from work. I fought, believing he'd return to his kind self if he calmed down. I decided to endure, prepared to protect Nick from harm, but it wasn't easy. Amidst these unresolved issues with Susan and Michael, Nick turned nine. He loved basketball and started attending a clinic held by an amateur basketball team. Having something to focus on, and less time facing Susan, he seemed much happier. Then, one day, he started feeling unwell. At first, I thought he'd overdone it with basketball and let him rest, but a week passed without improvement. It seemed to worsen, so I took him to the pediatrician we'd always relied on. They suggested we get more thorough tests at a larger hospital. I was clueless about big hospitals. The only experience I had was when David was treated. The doctor, having connections, wrote a referral for us. I was advised to get a medical consultation as soon as possible preferably by tomorrow. I was grateful for seeing a familiar doctor first, but at the same time terrified that Nick might have a serious illness. I told Michael, asking him to come with us, but he refused. It's probably just him faking it. Did something happen at school? If you believe everything a kid says, no amount of money will ever be enough. Big hospitals are expensive. Right. Cover it with your part-time income. I've heard of kids using sickness as a way to rebel against their parents. But would a child fake being sick to the point of not eating well? And continue it for a week? Even adults find it hard to fast for a week to make a statement. It requires extraordinary determination. In any case, Nick's illness lasting a week surely meant something was wrong. I had no issue paying with my part-time income and declared to Michael that I would take Nick to the hospital alone. He just responded with a dismissive do whatever you want and was visibly upset that evening. The next day at the hospital, they prepared for the worst case scenario. When I asked the doctor what that meant, they said pediatric cancer. Symptoms can be similar to a cold, including abdominal pain or sudden weight loss. They asked if I had noticed anything unusual. And Nick revealed he had been experiencing joint pain. When I asked why he hadn't mentioned it, he said he didn't want to worry me more or have me face unpleasant comments from Michael and Susan. I felt terrible that he was suffering yet worried about me. Perhaps if I had managed things better with Michael and Susan, I would have noticed the signs of Nick's discomfort earlier. As I reflected on my shortcomings, another shock hit me. Nick's illness was an early symptom of pediatric cancer. He had to be hospitalized, and while preparing for his stay, I informed Michael and Susan. Pediatric cancer. A worthless burden that costs a fortune. I won't pay a dime. Cancer hereditary, right. David died of cancer, didn't he? Thanks for passing on such a great legacy. Michael added coldly, their heartlessness was beyond belief. Cancer treatments can be quite expensive. 
Susan was only worried about the cost. Michael even said in front of me that the treatment expenses would come out of my part-time income. I couldn't stand being around these foolish people any longer, so I quickly left for the hospital where Nick awaited. Nick had to give up basketball, which he loved, and his enjoyable school life to focus on the treatment. Fortunately, the pediatric ward had a school, so he wouldn't fall behind in his studies. But seeing other children in much worse conditions was a shock to him. Will I end up like them? Will I never play basketball again? I wanted to become a star player to make your life easier, Mom. He felt guilty for burdening me with his illness. It's said that a patient's mental state can influence their condition, so I was advised to avoid making him feel like a burden. I've never blamed him, but maybe my worry showed Maybe I unconsciously emitted an aura of anxiety that he picked up on. I resolved to bolster my spirits and encourage Nick, who was becoming increasingly disheartened. There were times he cried out, wishing to die rather than getting better. The side effects were so painful that it seemed unbearable. They say even adults find some cancer treatment stuff to the point where they feel like giving up. I thought I understood the hardships of cancer treatment from David's experience, but he hadn't undergone extensive treatment. In reality, I only thought I knew. You can say anything with words. But I wanted to truly support Nick. I sought opportunities to hear from those who had experienced similar situations. We were introduced to a college hospital where I met a student who had survived pediatric cancer. I listened to the person's story and asked what words were painful and what words made him or her happy. And what they wished to hear was incredibly helpful. Despite our struggles, neither Michael nor Susan visited Nick Frankly, their presence would likely dampen our spirits, so their absence was preferable. However, a bit of concern when I returned home for Nick's clothes would have been appreciated. Back at the hospital again. Aren't you my wife? Why are you neglecting our home to do this? The rare times he spoke to me were just to berate me for prioritizing Nick over being a good wife. Whether at the hospital or home, there was never a moment of peace for me. I was constantly on edge, barely getting by on sheer willpower. Amidst all this, my father-in-law, Bob, was the only one who consistently came to visit us. His care for Nick and me, and our light-hearted conversations, allowed us to momentarily forget the harsh reality. I can't be more grateful to Bob. It was also a joy to see Nick, who usually seemed uninterested, smile more whenever his grandfather visited. Bob once confided in me that he had lost a close friend to cancer. Having witnessed the burden on the caregiving family and his friends struggle with harsh treatments, he expressed a desire to help us in any way he could. Just knowing his intentions was enough for me. I wish that Michael and Susan, who I live with, could have even a tenth of Bob's compassion. But expecting something and being let down hurts more, so I decided not to hope for anything. One day, Susan and Michael, who had shown no interest in Nick's battle with illness, came to his hospital room. How long do you plan to run away from home like a teenage rebel? The house is a mess because you're not there. A wife has her duties, right? When it's time for someone to die, they'll die. So just leave it be. The cure for cancer is just a matter of luck anyway. Cure for cancer a matter of luck. Everyone dies eventually. What are those the words you say in a ward where many are striving for recovery?
Were they always this despicable? I was so enraged and dumbfounded that I lost all reason. There are things you should and shouldn't say, right? There's a time and place for everything, isn't there? Don't you, who have lived many times longer than Nick, know that? Maybe you both should get a brain scan. Sometimes tumors in the brain can cause personality changes. I remembered some medical drama with a similar plot, though it was a vague memory. I said it confidently, hoping to scare them a bit. You're insulting the mother who raised me. Your son's weak and got cancer because of your poor parenting, right? I read online that cancer can be instantly cured by just taking vitamins. I'll cure him. Michael grabbed Nick's half-finished orange juice and poured it over his head. It was a move so unexpected that I couldn't intervene. Nick and I were so shocked that we could only stand there, stunned, Michael and Susan pointed and laughed at us. I'm going on a trip with mom. If your stupid sin's illness isn't cured by the time we return, who knows what we'll do. Keep that in mind. Make sure you clean up the house by the time we're back. They left the room after their one-sided tirade. As the tension eased, Nick burst into tears, overwhelmed by fear. The nurses rushed in upon hearing the commotion, busying themselves with cleaning and changing the sheets. Meanwhile, Nick and I waited in an empty room. I apologized to Nick for making our supposedly normal life, especially our home, a place of fear for him. I regretted my naive hope that reducing contact with Susan could somehow make things better. And for enduring these past years, I apologized to Nick. He comfortingly said he endured the mean granny just like I did, showing his kind nature. I vowed to exact an unforgettable revenge on Michael and Susan for their cruel words to Nick. About a week after making my vow of revenge, Michael called me. Hey, why can't I get into my own house? What kind of wife locks out her husband? Do you forget his providing for you? His voice was so loud, it rang in my ears, even with the phone's volume down. When did that house become his, anyway? That house was inherited from David. Michael suggested we start our married life there since his apartment lease was nearing renewal. He had said we'd eventually move to a new place, but there was no sign of that happening. Before remarrying, a friend of David had offered to buy the house, offering a price above market value. I considered it, thinking we'd move to a new home after remarrying, and Michael might feel uncomfortable in David's house. The offer was tempting, with the location and layout being ideal, and they were willing to meet my asking price. However, I couldn't part with the memories of David and kept the house. I told them we could discuss it again when I was ready to sell. However, Michael never mentioned moving out, and Susan made herself at home, leading to our current situation. I recalled someone saying that memories aren't in things but in people's minds. It's only now that I truly understand that sentiment albeit a bit late. I should have sold the house when Susan started to overstay. When I approached David's acquaintance about selling the house, although it was belated, they were delighted to help. They even apologized for bringing up the sale during a time when I was grieving. The paperwork for the sale had already been completed. They were considerate about my move and Nick's illness agreeing to work around my schedule for handing over the house. I was grateful, but to truly get revenge on Michael and Susan, I moved out promptly. I sent Michael and Susan's belongings to their family home, charging them for the shipping. Nick and I took only the essentials and had already moved into our new place. 
When Michael kept insisting it was his house, I reminded him it was inherited from David and belonged to me. He was momentarily taken aback but quickly retaliated. Even if that's true, you had no right to make decisions without consulting me, who lived there with you. I paid for the maintenance, so it's my house. Living in the house, we also faced issues like poor water flow and faulty toilets, signs of deterioration. He argued nonsensically that because he had paid for some repairs, the house belonged to him. I ignored his reasoning and declared my intention to divorce him. Hearing our conversation, Susan interjected. What an ungrateful woman. After accepting you, a remarried woman with baggage, as a daughter-in-law, you want a divorce? Women like you are a nuisance wherever you go. I'm saying I'll disappear from your lives, which should make you happy. Why not just agree to the divorce? You should be relieved to see me go. Be honest for once. Caught by the truth, Susan fell silent I didn't think this gave me the upper hand, though. I had to be extra cautious and not give them any advantage. When I discussed selling the house, David's acquaintance asked if something had happened. I confessed that I had planned to sell the house inherited from David once I found a new place to live with Michael. However, that was delayed due to his procrastination and Susan's domineering presence. I had given up on mending my relationship with Susan long ago. I admitted my indecisiveness in hoping Michael would return to his former self. The acquaintance, after hearing everything, sympathized with our situation and introduced me to a competent lawyer. The lawyer, very supportive, assured me we'd pursue a divorce that would lead to happiness for us. I initiated the divorce through the lawyer, and Michael eventually agreed, finalizing it. There was a reason David's acquaintance was so helpful. They were executives at a company that did business with Michael's employer. And Michael was the responsible officer for that account. When they requested a change of personnel from Michael's company, he was summoned by his boss, who demanded to know what offense he had committed. The company didn't want to lose a major client. Michael, clueless, denied any wrongdoing. However, upon further investigation by his boss, it was revealed that Michael had a bad reputation and his colleagues confirmed he had been cruel to his stepson. I heard that Michael was going around telling his colleagues and subordinates that his stepson was weak, stupid, and useless. Just recently, he boasted about curing Nick's supposed pediatric cancer by pouring vitamin-rich orange juice over his head. A subordinate checked the website Michael mentioned. Finding it suspicious and linked to a scam recently exposed in the news. The organization Michael was involved with turned out to be the seller of so-called miracle water at outrageous prices. When he was severely reprimanded by his boss, he defiantly responded. Does it matter to the company what I do to the kid? It's none of your business. He even bragged about how he had disciplined Nick. The company pointed out his behavior deviated too much from normal societal standards and told him it was too risky to keep such a person employed in this day and age. He was fired. Later, he heard rumors that an executive at a client company was acquainted with me. In reality, the person was a friend of David but rumors often get twisted. Panicked Michael sought my help. He showed up at my workplace, unaware of my new address. It turns out David's friend had been making moves, complicating his efforts to find a new job. Even without their interference, he would have had to explain his firing from the previous company. 
There must have been a significant reason for it. I told Michael, who only came to me when he was in trouble, that he got what he deserved and turned him away. Susan had nonchalantly returned to her family home, but there was no place for her anymore. When I decided to divorce, I made sure to tell Bob, who adder at Nick, everything that had happened. He was heartbroken that his young grandson had been targeted and became furious upon learning the truth. The fact that Alice had also been mistreated by Susan came to light, and he finally lost his patience with her. When Susan returned as if nothing had happened, he told her they were getting divorced. Initially, she resisted, but then agreed, thinking it was better to receive alimony than to stay with an unwanted Alice and a husband who no longer cared for her. However, she ended up being the one who had to pay alimony, demanded by her Alice for mental distress. Michael, who had been temporarily staying with Susan, was also kicked out of the family home after Bob discovered their mistreatment of me and Nick. Susan and Michael are now living together in a run-down apartment, surviving as best as they can. He struggles to find steady work, managing only to get by with day labor. Susan, having been a housewife for years, refuses to work, and they are constantly fighting, each blaming the other. Their loud arguments have even led to noise complaints and warnings from the police. Both are to blame. Susan initiated the trouble, and Michael went along with it, but he shares the responsibility from the moment he participated. As for Susan, she seems too stubborn and thick-skinned to be affected by any downfall. After everything was settled, Bob visited me and Nick once, he was deeply apologizing for the actions of his wife and son. He wished us happiness and quietly gave me some money as compensation, which I initially refused. But he insisted, saying it was the least he could do since he couldn't be there to see Nick recover. Once I divorced, Nick felt a sense of relief from being free of the fear and control of his stepfather and grandmother and his mood stabilized. The doctor started noting his good condition more frequently as he became more positive. Having goals helped him endure tough treatments without complaints. His efforts paid off, and he was granted temporary discharge. If there were no issues, he could gradually return to normal life while continuing treatment. Over time, his condition further stabilized, allowing him to attend school with some restrictions. Though he sometimes needs to be hospitalized, it's not for as long as before. He sets small goals for himself, like things to do or eat after his hospital stays or treatments, focusing on his recovery. This school and its students are understanding and supportive giving me peace of mind when sending him there. I feel relieved and happy seeing his steady recovery. Now, I'm determined to walk towards greater happiness with Nick, side by side. Think about it. You're just a fake parent. I was speechless. Why did I have to be subjected to such harsh words? John, my husband Mike's son, recently got into a prestigious medical school. I had decided to cover his entrance fee and had just been to the bank. When I got back, I showed them the suit I prepared for the ceremony. And that's when it happened. Their reaction was cold. Mike frowned and John looked visibly upset. I couldn't understand why. Being called fake left me feeling deeply wounded. Yeah, you fake parent. Don't come to the ceremony. Overwhelmed with disappointment, I couldn't respond. Who would have thought that the family I decided to love could turn on me so easily? 
it was more than just sad. After that, every day seemed to lose its color. On the day of the ceremony, I didn't go and left the suit in my room. Just then, my cell phone rang. It was Mike. Hey, what's this all about, you liar? He yelled furiously, like a man on fire. The truth, unknown even to myself, was soon to be revealed by the person next to me. My name is Sarah Thompson, and I'm a 51-year-old single woman. All my friends are married, and some of them even have kids who are adults now. Lately, I've been having Morty parties with friends who have finished raising their kids and now enjoy their free time. Listening to their stories, I find some endearing and others seem quite challenging. But everyone doesn't seem much different. I mutter to myself on the way home from these tea gatherings. I wonder how I would be spending my time if I had a husband and children. Would I be reflecting on the tough and happy times of raising children like my friends? Yet, I'm not overly troubled by not being married. What I often think about are my deceased parents. My father had been ill since he was young. Even in pain from his treatments, he always smiled kindly, like the sun. He continued his hobby of reading even when bedridden and sometimes recommended books to me. I lost him around when I was 30 and cried with my mother. After his death, I became listless and shocked for a while. It seems the same happened to my mother. After losing him, she suddenly became very forgetful and our house became a mess. Although she used to be tidy, something was wrong. Realizing this, I convinced her to go to the hospital, where we were told she had started to develop dementia. Living alone, I immediately moved back to my childhood home to care for her. Since then, I spent my time caring for my mother and facing her dementia. She would start looking for the trash I had thrown out. Despite no one visiting, she would insist someone had come and frequently open the front door. Eventually, she even acted sadly, claiming that a cat we never owned had died. My mother and I spent a tumultuous 20 years in a haze of confusion. Recently, I lost her too. Amid the loss, I finished her funeral and started organizing her belongings. It's not something that ends in a day or two. I proceed slowly, taking breaks as needed. I opened the window and looked up at the sky. The clear winter sky was mixed with the breeze of spring. It had been a while since I felt the flow of the seasons. Maybe I've been too tense all this time. With a sigh, I took a deep breath and stood up to make some coffee. Just then, the doorbell rang. Looking through the intercom camera, I saw a woman who lives in the apartment complex. I had inherited an old apartment complex before my parents passed away and have been the landlord since my 30s. As a result, I am close with the residents. Everyone is friendly and kind sharing fruits and vegetables with me when the season comes. The apartment is about a 10-minute walk from my childhood home. Her coming all this way suggested there might be some trouble. Feeling slightly anxious, I went to see that it was not the case. She had come to check on me after hearing about my mother's death. She was about the same age as my mother and they were very close. I responded with a forced smile. I'm fine. I knew this day would come eventually. But, you know, it seems like you've been a bit down lately. I'm really okay. Your mother was such a big help to me. Yes, I know. Her eyes were swollen from crying. 
showing her genuine sorrow. After sharing some memories, we promised to visit the grave together. Having someone who cherished her like this would surely make my mother happy. Suddenly, I remembered something. The apartment complex needs to be demolished soon. Just before my mother passed away, I received a letter from the city office about a meeting. It explained that a city development project was decided upon, and the land where the apartment now stands is to be turned into a road. That's five years away. Sipping my coffee, I stared blankly at the calendar on the table. Within these five years, I need to arrange for the residents to relocate and find a demolition company for the apartment. I learned that the city office would cover part of the demolition costs if I applied for it. Yet, the thought of demolishing the building is quite daunting. Even though it's an old apartment from an outsider's perspective, it holds sentimental value for me. Thinking back, there were numerous challenges like frozen water pipes, clogged toilets, and noise complaints. There were issues I couldn't solve alone and managed only with the help of my parents or by consulting with professionals. Spending days looking through paint swatches for the exterior walls is a fond memory. It's a shame, but it has to be done. The residents will need time to find new places to live. I should put up a notice soon. Losing my mother and now having to let go of the apartment is very sad. To distract myself, I gulped down my coffee and started to work on the notice, putting aside the task of sorting through the belongings. The apartment residents came to visit me one after another, day by day. They come out of concern for me. Those who have known me longer often share memories of my mother, leading to long conversations. Of course, there are others who talk to me too. Recently, I've been talking a lot with Mike Scott, who moved in about a year ago. He chose this apartment for its rent, which is lower than the market rate in the area. Living with his son, he mentioned the high cost of education. It's been tough for you, Sarah. Well, it can't be helped. My mother must be smiling down from heaven now. You're strong. I lost my wife a few years ago, and it was hard to recover. Oh, really? Yes. She had a serious illness, a complicated one. Was she hospitalized? She wasn't, but I took care of her at home. It must have been tough, especially with a son to take care of. Taking care of my wife and replacing her in cooking and attending school meetings for our son was hard. His hearty laughter gave no hint of such difficulties. Perhaps that's part of his charm. Moreover, his stories are always interesting and bring me joy. Talking with Mike, the sadness of losing my mother and the need to demolish the apartment seemed to vanish. Gradually, I realized I was drawn to him. Even while shopping, I found myself wondering what Mike's favorite dishes were. Oh my, what am I thinking? I made a quick brushing gesture beside my face, trying to wave away unnecessary thoughts. I'm in my 50s, I need to act my age. I told myself that, trying to convince myself of the sentiment. But whenever I saw Mike, our cheerful conversations made me forget such resolutions. Before long, Mike and I became close and started talking frequently. One sunny day, Mike came to me with a serious expression. He mentioned he had something to discuss, so I decided to invite him in that day to hear what he had to say. I wondered if he had come to talk about moving out 
especially since I had recently put up a notice. Sitting across from each other, feeling somewhat restless, he suddenly started to speak. Actually, the thing I wanted to talk about is, well... What is it? You seem so formal. Well, I've liked you for a long time, Sarah. Slowly, he took out a small case from his pocket. He said to me as he opened a lid, Will you marry me? Inside was a very elegant ring, sparkling. Me, are you sure? I was so surprised that I blinked several times. I thought it might be a mistake or a joke, but it seemed genuine. Mike leaned in and said, You seem so composed, yet so lively when we talk. I want to be with you in the future. But I'm already 51. Age doesn't matter. I don't choose people based on that. Mike said earnestly, looking me in the eyes. Marriage is about sharing a life. I want you to be the one with whom I share and live my life. Mike. But maybe I'm not right for you. I have a grown child and all. That's not an issue at all. I feel the same about you. And so I accepted his proposal, and we decided to marry. That night, soaking in the bath, I stared at the ceiling. I never imagined that at this halfway point in my life, such things would happen. Life is full of surprises. While looking at my sagging arms, I wondered if I could even wear a wedding dress. As these thoughts dominated my mind for a few days, Mike came with joyful news. His son, John, had passed the entrance exam for a prestigious medical school. Wow, congratulations. It's really great. He was so tense during the exams. Now we can finally relax a bit. We should celebrate. How about ordering some pizza? Well, there's a bit of a problem. What happened? The thing is, even though he passed, we can't afford the tuition fees for medical school. They are quite high. That's terrible. At least we need to figure out the entrance fee by the deadline. Seeing him so troubled, I felt overwhelmed too. If nothing changed, John wouldn't be able to enroll in medical school. If only I had been more responsible. Mike clenched his fists, his frustration apparent. He said he wanted to cure his mother's illness, and that's why he aimed for medical school. I wasn't aware of the exact cost of medical education. Supporting the full amount would be difficult, but maybe I could manage the entrance fee. Um, I can take care of the entrance fee. Really? Immediately, his face brightened. Yes, after all, we're family now, aren't we? Thank you. Thanks to you, John can become a fine doctor. Please don't cry. Let's support John together. Afterward, I inquired about the exact amount for the entrance fee and started arranging the payment. Actually, I had received some money from the city office for the apartment demolition and relocation. I checked my bank balance using the app and told Mike and John that I could cover the entrance fee. Thank goodness. Thank you, Sarah. No, Mom. It really is great. Come on, let's celebrate with some pizza. Congratulations on passing, John. That looks delicious. Let's eat. We reached for the pizza one after another, quickly clearing the plate. Seeing them happily eating and saying delicious, delicious, I felt a surge of joy, as if I was watching my own son. Thinking about starting a new life with these wonderful people, made me feel much more positive. I will do my best for this new family. That was the thought that came to me. The next day, 
I went to the bank after confirming the details for the payment of the entrance fee. The bank was quiet that day, and I was quickly called after taking a number. As I approached the counter, I caught the eye of a person at the back and nodded in greeting. It was Marvin Morris, the branch manager. When he noticed me, he stopped what he was doing and came over. Sarah, long time no see. How have you been? Fine, thanks to you. I appreciate all your help before. Marvin had assisted me with the inheritance of the apartment and other assets. We had known each other for about 20 years. I vividly remember how supportive he was when my mother passed away. My father used to say that Marvin was a sharp and reliable person. What brings you here today, huh? I showed him my bank book and the transfer form. I've just recently decided to get married. I'm here to transfer the entrance fee for my fiancé's son. Oh, that's wonderful. I thought he would say that, but he didn't. Instead, his expression clouded slightly, and he looked at the transfer form and then at me with a hint of skepticism. May we talk a bit about this in private? Both the teller and I, with question marks hovering over our heads, followed Marvin. He led us to a small room at the back of the bank, the same place I had visited for inheritance consultations. Marvin stared intently at the transfer form and then asked me a question. This is for medical school, right? The son intends to become a doctor? Yes. That's what I've been told. If you don't mind, could you tell me how you came to decide to marry this person? Ah, uh, taken aback, I decided to tell the truth. After losing my mother, I began talking more with Mike, one of the residents I manage. He raised his only son while caring for his wife with a serious illness. His wife had passed away a few years ago and now it's just him and his son living together. He proposed, saying he wanted to spend the rest of his life with me. Then, right after that, John's entrance fee issue came up. I felt motivated to work hard for my new family. That's truly wonderful. But, this Mike person... Oh my goodness, I've been calling him Mike. I mean, Mr. Scott. Mike Scott. Marvin repeated the name softly, then tapped his fingers on the desk as if pondering. With a rhythmic tap, 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 the sound filled the room. In just a few seconds, he stopped tapping and said, May I keep this transfer form? But why? Just leave this matter to me. He said with a reassuring smile, standing up, after opening the door to the small room, he said, please. And I left the bank, still confused. On my way home, I felt as if I had been bamboozled, reflecting on Marvin's actions. He had a slightly complex expression when he heard Mike's name. Why was that? Yet, he is a trustworthy person. He had asked me to trust him and there had never been a time when he wasn't reliable. There's still time before the deadline, so it should be fine. I decided to leave everything in Marvin's hands. That evening, I showed Mike and his son the suit I had prepared for the ceremony. It was a neat, two-piece white suit. What do you both think? But their reaction was cold. Did you buy it? Seriously, you're coming to the ceremony. Mike frowned, and John looked visibly displeased. I couldn't understand why. What? Is it not okay? Think about it. You're just a fake parent. My heart thumped heavily at those words. Being called a fake felt like a deep thorn was thrust into my heart. Yeah, Sarah. A fake parent shouldn't come to the ceremony.
A fake parent shouldn't come to the ceremony. No words came out of me. Why did I have to hear such cruel words? Just as everything seemed to go white before my eyes, Mike let out a deep sigh. Let's just tell the truth. The truth. Why do you think we were so nice to you? For the money. It's for my tuition and fees. No, that can't be. There's no other benefit to marrying a plain woman like you. What, what do you mean? Was it all an act? Yes, it was. It took a long time to get close to you and arrange the marriage. I would have preferred a younger and prettier mother. You're the apartment manager and your parents just died. We thought you had a lot of inheritance. I wanted you to pay for all the tuition fees. What a disappointment. I can't believe you only agreed to pay the entrance fee. That's too much. There's a limit to everything. So, that's enough. Let's send this family charade. This isn't some drama, so let's stop pretending to be nice. They laughed heartily. Stunned, I stood there, not understanding what was so funny. Overwhelmed with disappointment, I couldn't muster a response. The white suit seemed like a testament to my own foolish excitement. Who could have predicted that the family I chose to love would turn on me so easily? It was too sad to be summed up in just a few words. Their laughter echoed in my ears, and I covered them, wishing not to hear. From that day on, they continued to ignore me, treating me as if I were invisible, even when I was right beside them. I grew tired of being treated like I didn't exist. I grew tired of living like that. Thinking about the future, I was so filled with anxiety and worry that I couldn't even sit still at night. Days of sleeplessness continued, and before I knew it, the day of the entrance ceremony had arrived. On that day, I didn't go to the entrance ceremony and left the suit in my room as I went out. I wandered through the streets, regretting my naive actions up until that point. Why did I fall for their deceit so easily? It was my fault for not being more skeptical. I wondered how I should deal with those two in the future. That was all I could think about. Then suddenly, I felt a tap on my shoulder and heard my name called. Turning around, I saw Marvin smiling at me. I saw you by chance. What's going on? Um, I couldn't possibly confess that I had been deceived by my fiancé and his son. So I awkwardly averted my eyes. Just then, my smartphone rang. The caller was Mike. Excuse me, I need to take this call. I told Marvin and pressed the answer button. Mike was furious, yelling as if on fire. What the hell is this, you liar? Excuse me. At the registration desk, they said his enrollment is canceled because the entrance fee of two million yen hasn't been paid. That can't be right. Explain this. On the phone, the two were shouting. Indeed, I had gone to the bank that day and left the transfer form with Marvin. As I stood there bewildered, Marvin reached out to me. Let me explain. He took the smartphone from my hand, put it on speaker, and began to speak. Mike Scott, hello. I'm Marvin Morris. A banker from around here. What? You caused a commotion in another town before. Embezzling company funds and facing charges. Marvin stated this calmly and clearly. What are you talking about? You fled here from your hometown. I see. It was quite the surprise for me. Hey, don't talk nonsense about my father. It would be better if it were nonsense. But I remember it well. It was quite the scandal. Stop it. After all, 
It was an embezzlement case that involved our bank due to business dealings with the company. It's hard to forget. The smile vanished from Marvin's face. Instead, he had a very stern expression, choosing his words as if recalling the past. I remember your name. When Sarah mentioned you, I couldn't help but be suspicious. What, Sarah, what have you said? I heard you got married. Quick action on your part to remarry right after a divorce. Divorce? You said she was dead. Was that a lie too? She wasn't terminally ill. And her death was a lie too. You were told to divorce because of that scandal. Shut up. Just transfer the entrance fee. You probably approached kind-hearted Sarah, pretending to be a man in distress to arrange some money, right? Shut up. Hank Sarah, don't listen to him. He's lying. No, Mike. It's you who's lying. The day I went to the bank, I realized I had forgotten something on my way home and returned to the bank. That's when I ran into Marvin. He expressed concern about something regarding Mike and asked me to wait a bit before proceeding with the transfer. Trusting Marvin and knowing there was time until the payment deadline, I left the money in the account. By mentioning my bank visit, they mistakenly assumed I had transferred the entrance fee. But I never said I had done it. That night, after showing the suit, I discovered their true nature and intentions. Then I understood the true intention behind Marvin's request to wait with the transfer. I was on my way to the bank to confirm it today. Meeting him in the middle of the city was unexpected, but everything made sense after hearing the whole story. I kept asking you two to talk to me. What's this all of a sudden? But you both ignored me so you didn't know I hadn't transferred the money. Silence fell on the other end of the phone. Faced with the truth from both Marvin and me, they were left speechless. Seconds later, the call ended abruptly, leaving only the sound of the bustling street around me. Soon after, Mike and I quickly proceeded with the divorce. He probably decided to cut ties after realizing everything was exposed, including my financial situation. I never thought the laughing figure of him was just an illusion. He and John left my apartment and this town as if fleeing. John had a history of misconduct in high school, causing frequent troubles. But his academic performance was good so it seems the teachers overlooked it. I looked pensively at the room they had vacated, recalling such tidbits of information. Can such things really happen? It's like something out of a drama or movie, a story where it's hard to tell what's true and what's not. Yet, John had the capability to pass the entrance exam for a challenging medical school. I regretted that his intellect couldn't be used for something better. No more marriage for me. A few years later, my apartment was rebuilt in a different location. Moreover, the new location was just a few minutes walk from the original site. On the day I posted the notice on the apartment, I also consulted the city office about the relocation expenses. During that time, due to an unexpected discovery, a mistake was found in the construction blueprints of the development project. As a result, the development area was reassessed, and it was decided that the apartment could remain in place with just a slight adjustment to its location. This news surprised and delighted both me and the residents. Although the reconstruction took some time, it was completed sooner than expected. Taking this opportunity, the plumbing and other facilities were completely updated. But will the residents choose to stay? As I observed and thought about this, it seemed that they were indeed planning to stay. 
Sorry to trouble you, but we'll be staying a bit longer. She, who had promised to visit the grave with me to mourn my mother's death, said this with a smile. Now we visit the grave together once or twice a year and have meals together, maintaining a close friendship. All the residents moved to the new apartment and the relocation went smoothly. The development project progressed, changing not just the apartment, but also the surrounding atmosphere. With the new road constructed, delivery drivers are happy about the easier access. Going to the nearby supermarket has also become easier due to the wider roads. It felt as though the atmosphere had brightened a bit. The interactions with the apartment residents remained unchanged. Everyone remains friendly and pleasant as always. Life is really unpredictable. My quiet murmur dissolved into the clear blue sky. What the heck? I don't get it. When I went to a town I don't usually visit for shopping, I witnessed my husband and my mother walking arm in arm, intimately and kissing in public without any regard for the onlookers. Shocked, I rushed over to confront them, but far from showing any remorse, they defiantly justified their actions. I immediately went to my parents' house, told my father about the two, and got a divorce. However, after my father passed away, I had to meet my mother and ex-husband again. Seeing my mother for the first time in a while, she was wearing loose clothing, and her belly was visibly swollen. Noticing my gaze, she smiled triumphantly. Oh, did you notice? I'm carrying a child. Seems like you waited forever but couldn't have one, huh? Unlike you, we managed to have a child right away. Now, I can finally become a father. Breaking up with you was a good thing. They hurled insults at me, intending to hurt me as much as possible. However, their plan backfired. Unfortunately for them, I wasn't hurt at all. Oh, that's hilarious. You two are such idiots. I laughed so hard I had to hold my stomach. My name is Mia, and I'm a 24-year-old office worker. My parents had me when they were very young. In what you'd call a shotgun wedding. Both of them were quite flashy in their youth. My mother, Linda, was just 16, still in high school, when she met my father, Kevin, a construction worker four years her senior, and had me. Their love story began when my mother fell head over heels for my father and aggressively pursued him until he gave in, and they started dating. Soon after, she got pregnant with me, and they got married. Getting married as a high school student was frowned upon by society, but since my mother was already pregnant with me, they had no choice but to accept it. The early days of their marriage seemed to go well, when I was in kindergarten, my father would often come to pick me up on his days off from work due to rain. Your dad is so young and cool. Right? I love my dad. He's so kind. I loved walking home under the same umbrella with my dad, talking about our day. However, an incident struck my father changing my mother's attitude towards him drastically. My father fell while dismantling scaffolding at work, sustaining serious injuries. Injuries include full body bruising and complex fractures. When his body became disabled, my mother turned cold. Fortunately, he survived but he was left with lasting physical impairments, making it impossible for him to continue his construction job. Thanks to rehabilitation, my father managed to walk again and through a friend, found employment at a company. However, he needed long-term rehabilitation. 
During this time, my mother refused to have anything to do with him. From attending medical appointments to everyday assistance, she even ignored him when he fell in the hallway or threw sarcastic comments his way. Showing off by falling. Pathetic. Ah, marrying this burden was a mistake. I should have dated more men before settling down. When I was a kid, my mom would constantly grumble about my dad as if it were her catchphrase. But to me, it just looked like she was picking on him. And honestly, I didn't really like her for that. Due to my father's limited work capacity, our family wasn't exactly wealthy. My mother worked nights, so I spent more time with my dad during the day and was closer to him than to my mother. Perhaps because my mother noticed this, or maybe she was never fond of kids to begin with, she mostly neglected me, providing only the bare minimum care. I managed to graduate high school, but instead of going to college, my mother told me to work to help with the family finances, so I ended up taking a job at a local company. I'm sorry, Mia. It's because of my condition that you have to bear this burden. Don't say that. I'm happy to work if it helps you, Dad. My father apologized for not being able to send me to college, feeling guilty. Although I hated to comply with my mother's demands, I worked hard for my father. A few years after I started working, I married my colleague, John. I didn't want a cold marriage like my parents had. I wanted to build a warm home with him. I'll take care of you, Mia. Let's be happy together. I want lots of kids too. I was so happy to hear those words that I accepted his proposal right away. However, a year into our marriage, there was no sign of us having children. I wanted children too, but no matter how long we waited, there were no signs of pregnancy. John started to pressure me, as if it was all my fault. Damn. Why can't we have kids? All my co-workers already have children. It must be something wrong with your body. What a letdown for a wife. Don't say that. It's not just my issue. I want you to come with me to the gynecologist for a checkup. What? Why do I have to go through such trouble? I've always been healthy. Never even caught a cold. It's obviously your fault we can have kids. My husband blamed me alone and wouldn't even listen to the suggestion of fertility treatment. Instead, he berated me for not being able to have children because of me. Stop making excuses and get treated at a hospital already. It's embarrassing for me that we're married and can't have kids. He wouldn't listen to me at all, just blamed me one-sidedly. Still clinging to a sliver of hope, I pursued fertility treatments alone, but there was no sign of us having a child. And then, John started coming home less and less. He said he was busy with work and started coming home in the morning more frequently. Is it really work? Could he be cheating, now that I think about it? I had several reasons to suspect my husband. There were times when I could smell women's perfume on his clothes when he came home in the morning. Not just once, but several times. Moreover, when I checked the credit card statements, there were charges for unexplained expenses that further fueled my suspicions. However, I thought confronting him directly would only lead to evasive answers, so I waited for the right moment to talk. And that moment came soon enough. It happened when I went out to a town. I usually don't visit for shopping. I saw my husband, although he said he had to work on this holiday. Is that John? But he's supposed to be at work today. I was about to call out to him when I noticed a woman walking beside him. What? Why is my mom walking with John? 
There, walking beside him with a smile, was my mother. Since getting married, I had distanced myself from my mother. I had visited my father at home, but rarely brought my husband there. There was supposed to be no contact between my husband and my mother after our marriage greetings. Curious, I watched them without calling out, and to my shock, they held hands and kissed right in front of me. What? This makes no sense. I ended up raising my voice. They didn't notice me, stunned, and continued walking away. Finally, I couldn't hold back and shouted. Hey, John. Mom. What? What are you doing? When I caught up and called them out, they were visibly surprised to see me. Oh, what's the matter, Mia? You seem so flustered. It's not, what's the matter? What are you guys doing? What do you mean? I just happened to meet John here. So we were just saying hi, since it's been a while. Is there a problem with that? It seemed my mother was pretending to be oblivious. Seeing my mother dressed youthfully, you wouldn't think she was over 40 if not told. And then, getting closer to my mother, I realized something. This scent, I've smelled it before. The perfume my mother was wearing was familiar. It was the same scent I smelled on my husband's clothes when he returned home late. I didn't want to believe it, but I was convinced that my mother was my husband's affair partner. Don't lie. I saw you two kissing just now. What? You must be mistaken. We just bumped into each other, that's all. When pressed, the two exchanged a fleeting look of panic. But after a moment of silence, John admitted defeat and spoke. Oh, man, I never thought we'd get caught this early. Why are you even here? What's that supposed to mean? You're so oblivious. I thought we could have kept it under wraps a bit longer. But to think you were watching. Well, as you've guessed, I actually prefer older women. Sorry, I did feel bad for you, but I've been into John since we first met. My mom and husband unabashedly said something unbelievable. We just happened to bump into each other one day, had a lunch, and, well, one thing led to another. I'm still young. After all, I want to experience love. Our relationship was already strained. And as I confided in her, the more we talked, the more I was drawn to her. Yeah, I heard about it. Mia, having trouble conceiving, huh? John really wanted a boy. And because of you. Can't believe you'd say that to mom. Well, it's true, isn't it? Your body's the reason we can have kids. Unbelievably, it seemed my husband had shared everything, even our most private issues, with my mother. Struggling alone with infertility, my husband blamed me as if he were the victim, despite never listening to my concerns. Fury bubbled up within me, realizing there was no way I could continue this marriage. The audacity. Do you even realize what you're doing? I yelled at them, as they were nonchalantly making excuses. Can't help it. It's because you're a failure as a wife and a woman. Excuse me. I'm better off without a husband like you. I want a divorce. Fine by me. To be honest, I've been over you for a while. Always excuses, no kids. I'll be relieved to be rid of a defective product like you. Oh, I didn't intend for this to happen, but I guess I ended up taking your precious husband. Sorry about that. Despite clearly not feeling sorry, my mother offered a hollow apology. Mom, if Dad finds out about your affair, you'll be divorced too. Be prepared. Her complexion changed upon my words, 
but she quickly reverted to her smug demeanor. Well, like there's no proof of the affair. You and John getting divorced is your business, but I'll divorce when I please. Come on, John, let's go. Urged by my mother, they left me behind in haste. Despite their affair, unlike John, my mother didn't seem eager to divorce my father immediately. I went straight to my parents' house and told my dad everything. So, I injured all these years thinking you needed a mother, even if she was that kind of woman. But to disregard her daughter like this. My father grimaced at my report. I'm divorcing John. I can't stay with him after what he's done. What will you do about mom? Don't worry, I have a plan. I won't let them have their way. John later sent a completed divorce form by mail, which I signed, finalizing our divorce. My mother didn't return home after that, apparently eloping with John. Despite my anger, my father advised me to forget them both, and I decided to let go of my ex-husband and mother. I then moved out of the apartment I shared with John and returned to my childhood home. My father had become quite self-sufficient. Ironically, thanks to my mother's neglect. Despite everything, I'm happy to live with you again. Thanks for coming back. I enjoyed a brief period of peace with my father, but it didn't last. He contracted a widespread pneumonia and suddenly became gravely ill. Mia, I am sorry for all the hardships. Live your life as you wish from now on. On the brink of death, my father firmly held my hand and told me this. Tears welled up as I nodded in agreement. Despite medical efforts, his condition rapidly worsened, and he passed away. Dad, I wish I had been a better daughter before you left us so suddenly. As I prepared for his funeral, an unexpected visitor arrived. Long time no see. Heard he's gone. My mother and John, my ex-husband, were there. They stood at the door with disdainful smiles, barging into the house. What do you want now? Just go away. What? And who do you think you are? He and I are married, you know. It's only natural for a wife to rush over when her husband dies. So think you'd say such a thing after eloping and not contacting anyone for years. Oh, well. Say whatever you want, but no matter how much you scream and shout, I'm still his widow, which means I have a right to the inheritance. There was insurance too, wasn't there? I can't believe it. That's why you never divorced Dad. After suffering an injury, Dad retired from his construction job and worked hard at a company he joined later, eventually reaching a respectable position before he passed away. Despite having no formal education, it must have been the grit he developed during his days as a craftsman. He had many subordinates who admired him for his caring nature. All the more reason not to divorce. Now let's talk about dividing up the assets. He wasn't one for material desires, so I know he saved quite a bit. Let's see. Mom said this as she approached me. Suddenly, I realized something. Mom, in her loose clothing, her belly was clearly swollen. Noticing my gaze, she smiled triumphantly. Oh, you noticed. Yes, I'm carrying John's child. It seems you've been waiting for one you could never have. I'll bear the child in your stead. Different from you. I had a child easily. Now I can finally become a father. Breaking up with you was really for the best. The two of them hurled the most hurtful words they could at me. However, their plan backfired. 
Unfortunately for them, I wasn't hurt in the slightest. Oh, this is hilarious. Both of you look so foolish. I couldn't help but laugh, holding my stomach. The two of them looked at me, dumbfounded. What's so funny? Because it's ridiculous. Hey, I hate to say it, but are you sure that child is really John's? At my words, John asked, what? As if offended, but mom's demeanor suddenly changed. Bryce darted around, clearly flustered. But John seemed oblivious to it. It's definitely my child. Don't say such nonsensical things out of spite. Yes, that's right. Don't be sore losers. Hmm, whether it's a sore losers talk or not. This will clarify everything. I stepped away and retrieved a document I had kept, fristing it in front of them. What's this all of a sudden? What? What is this? What are you so surprised about? It can't be that. Huh? What does this mean? The two were shocked by the content of the document. It was a report from a private investigator detailing mom's social interactions. After mom eloped with John, I happened to see her in town. She was with a young man I didn't recognize, not John. Following them secretly, they entered a hotel together. What does this mean? Could it be that mom is? I talked with my father before he passed and decided to investigate mom's behavior. I thought it might be useful someday. The investigation confirmed that mom was indeed involved with a man other than John. John, with a look of disbelief, frantically reads through the documents. There, detailed information about his mother and her boyfriend is written. John, reading the report with disbelief, glared at mom next to him after finishing it. What is this report about? Were you deceiving me? That's absurd. Mia is lying. The baby is definitely yours. Despite being flistered, mom insisted the baby was John's. Who do you believe? Mia or me? Well, that's... Since you couldn't have a child, you're framing your own mother. What a terrible woman. John was persuaded by mom, regaining his composure. Declaring the report a lie, they turned their blame towards me, ignoring their own issues. You're free to believe what you want, but sadly, I have definitive proof. You can come out now. I called out towards the room next to the living room, where I currently was. Then the door opened, and a man walked in. Who the heck is that guy? Who? I don't know him either. Both of them were puzzled by the appearance of this unfamiliar man. This man is my husband. It's natural you wouldn't know, but I remarried. His name is Bob. I had divorced John a year ago and remarried him, whom I met through a friend. What proof does this man provide? Unlike my mother, it may not be visible yet, but I also have a baby in my belly. Of course, it's his child. So what? Say it clearly. Still don't get it. I couldn't have a baby no matter how hard we tried when we were married, but with him, with Bob, I got pregnant right away. John's eyes widened as he seemed to grasp the implication of my words. You were too lazy to go to the hospital, but I got checked properly and knew there was nothing wrong with my fertility. So, the problem with not having kids was you? No, that can't be. You're lying. But it's strange, isn't it? Supposed to be hard to have children, yet my mother is pregnant. I wonder if it's really your child. When I posed that question, John could not retort and glared at Linda next to him. Hey, speak the truth. 
Well, fine, you win. Oh, you admitted it quite fast. I thought you'd try to deceive us more. It was just a flame with John. What? What do you mean? I was with you because you were Mia's husband. You know, wanting what belongs to someone else. But my true love was another man. I was planning to break up with you soon. John was shocked by his mother's words and stood dumbfounded. I wanted to enjoy messing around with men until I got caught. Well, it doesn't matter. Whether or not the child I'm carrying is his, my right to inherit his wealth remains unchanged. Are you still talking about that? Unfortunately, you'll have to give up on that. What? How many times do I have to say the same thing? I wasn't divorced from my deceased husband, so I have the right to inherit. That's what I'm telling you. You have no such right. Because you and dad were divorced a long time ago. What? That can't be. Maybe you've forgotten because you're getting older, but dad had the divorce papers you filled out. When I reported my mother's affair to my father, what he took out was a set of divorce papers. According to dad, after a major fight when he became unable to work due to an injury, mom had said, I don't need a husband who can't move, and thrust the filled out divorce papers at him. Though he didn't submit them at the time because of me, dad had used those papers to divorce her before he died. So mom, you won't get a penny of dad's estate. Do you understand now? That's impossible. Seeing her face turn pale, the mother, who had been so confident just moments ago, is now visibly shaken. John was still glaring at her. I, I'll be leaving. After realizing her affair was exposed and she wouldn't receive any inheritance, my mother fled the house as if escaping. Later, my mother gave birth to a boy, but it was clear, even without a DNA test, based on blood types, that he wasn't John's child. John saying, I never thought she was such a whore, abandoned my mother when she no longer had any inheritance coming her way, and disappeared. The man my mother truly wanted, her affair partner, also fled upon learning of her pregnancy, as he was only in it for a casual relationship. In the end, my mother became a single mother at 40. She is raising a child on her own with no one to rely on, surviving on government support. Being an older mother, taking care of a young child was physically demanding, and she appeared significantly aged. I once saw my mother from a distance, carrying her child. Her appearance, now with more gray hair, looked more like a grandmother than a mother. Meanwhile, I gave birth to a healthy baby girl, and now our family of three lives happily together. Thinking about it, my mother's child is my brother, and he will be in the same grade as my daughter, which is quite complicated. On the anniversary of my father's death, we plan to visit his grave as a family of three. The betrayal of my ex-husband and mother was painful, but it allowed me to find an irreplaceable family. You're watching over us from heaven, aren't you? Surely, Dad up in heaven is rejoicing over the birth of his grandchild. Holding on to the love Dad gave us, we vow to continue walking closely as a family. I was working as the sales director at Tom's company. One day, I was absolutely floored by what Tom said when he got home. I got a 29-year-old beautiful employee pregnant. Please, let's get a divorce. I was taken aback. It was all too sudden, and I couldn't organize my farts. I told Tom that I wanted to have a discussion with the three of us later, 
and then I lay down on the bed in our bedroom. Emily was pregnant. It turned out I was the one with fertility issues. Even though I fought, I had lost all feelings for Tom, I couldn't stop the tears from flowing. The next day, I overheard a conversation between Tom and Emily. Tom, why didn't you dump a woman who can't have an heir? Because she is competent at her job. There's no reason to fire her. Then let's just keep her around. Once the baby is born, she can take care of it. You're smart, Emily. She's a middle-aged woman, so she probably knows a thing or two about parenting well. Hearing their laughter, I clenched my fists. Always talking nonsense. You guys enjoy it while it lasts. I'll make sure they regret ever making fun of me. I'm Maria, a 44-year-old housewife. Ten years ago, at a reunion with college friends, I reconnected with Tom. Tom is the only son of a well-known local famous company. He lost his father when he was young, and now his mother serves as the company's chairwoman. Back in college, I shared a class with Tom but never got close to him, because a lively group always surrounded him, and I felt inferior due to our different backgrounds. However, upon reuniting, I found he didn't flaunt his wealth and was actually very friendly and cheerful. Later, after dining out together, Tom asked me to be his girlfriend, and eventually, he proposed. My family is just an average middle-class household. I was nervous that his mother might object, thinking I wasn't good enough, but when we went to meet his parents, they accepted me without hesitation. It seemed to make a good impression that I had studied accounting and business management in college and had also obtained certifications. After getting engaged, I took a job at Tom's company, and now I'm working as the sales department manager, handling sales administration tasks. Growing up watching my parents' loving relationship, I always dreamed of getting married. I never doubted that if I were with the person I love, we could build a warm and loving home. So, I never thought our happiness would crumble in just a decade after getting married. At the beginning of our marriage, Tom was very kind to me. His friendships were extensive in addition to his company as the CEO, and so his weekends were scheduled almost every week. While they were Tom's friends, to me, they were strangers. So, I thought I'd be left out, but instead, Tom took me along to events like barbecues, camping, and skiing, introducing me to his friends. Among his friends were not only men but also women, couples, and married folks. Not having friends of the opposite sex myself, I felt uneasy about the existence of female friends, but Tom interacted with them with proper boundaries. Neither the female friends nor Tom showed any behavior that could lead to misunderstandings, and I was relieved. Given my shyness, I admired Tom for his ability to interact so friendly and without bias with everyone, such as single, married, male, and female. However, over the years, Tom's attitude toward me gradually became colder. He would frown upon seeing my face, sigh, or look displeased at the cosmetics I left in the bathroom. Tom, our anniversary is coming up soon, 
I'll make a reservation at our usual restaurant. When I mentioned this, he replied grumpily. Can't you see I'm busy with work? I don't have time to go to the restaurant. But you've always made time for that day no matter how busy you were. Then Tom sighed deeply and said in an exasperated tone, If you want to go, go by yourself. How long are you going to act like we're still newlyweds? I was disheartened by his harsh words. Surely, he must be tired and irritable. Thinking this, I sent him a tie from his favorite brand for his birthday, but he wasn't pleased. Maria, you have no fashion sense. I don't like this brand anymore. Why would I want more junk in my drawer? Oh no, I'm sorry. I had researched online and even went to the store to carefully choose it, only to be criticized like that. I couldn't recall doing anything to particularly upset him. Despite saying he was busy, he regularly went to gatherings with his friends. The thought crossed my mind, does he not want to go out with me? And then a definitive incident occurred. I was excited when invited to go to the mall, so I got ready with enthusiasm. I wore a brand new outfit and did my makeup more brightly for the private outing, eagerly waiting for Tom to be ready. But when Tom was ready to go, he looked at me and smirked. What's with that outfit? Wearing a skirt at your age is just ridiculous. Oh, no, doesn't it look good on me? Do you even realize your age? Once you're past 40, you're officially an old lady, right? Your makeup is too loud and curling your hair looks ridiculous. You might have been cute back in the day, but that's not the case anymore. His disdainful tone pierced through my heart. But your friends dress up stylishly, don't they? They can pull it off because they're beautiful. You're different. Trying to look young at your age just looks desperate and pathetic. I don't want to try making younger. Tom clicked his tongue in response to my rebuttal. Put on your normal clothes. Are you trying to embarrass me? Ah, uh, forget it, I've lost my interest in going out, you've ruined the mood, after I went through the trouble of inviting you. With a look of disgust, he threw his jacket on the sofa and retreated upstairs to his study. I want shrimp fried rice in 30 minutes, for today's lunch. His voice came down from the stairs. I was just a little excited about going out after a long time. Why did I upset Tom's mood? I bit my lip to hold back tears, changed back into my room clothes, removed my makeup, and started preparing lunch. Upon reflection, if I'm considered an old lady at our age, then Tom is an old man too. I may not be a beauty, but Tom is just an average middle-aged man. Just like any other middle-aged guy out there. Raised to be the next CEO of the company, he's always been full of pride and confidence. Before we got married, I saw those traits as admirable, but I never expected to be looked down upon like this. Sometimes, I feel like voicing my complaints out loud. But since we work together, I have to face Dom at the company. If there's awkward tension between us as a couple, it makes the employees feel uncomfortable too. With that in mind, I usually end up bending over backward to keep Tom's mood up. At home, Tom might be the lord and master, but step outside, and he's a completely different person, charming, leaving a great impression on everyone he meets, 
a textbook example of a second-generation heir with no real management skills, but loved by our clients and partners for his refreshing smile and affability. This is in stark contrast to his surliness at home. I'm the CEO, you know. Can I really be expected to eat such cheap food? I'd rather have instant noodles. He always complains if the meal isn't to his liking, slurping cup noodles next to me in a snide manner. Tom also seems to resent it whenever I have plans to go out while he's home. Going out without taking care of your husband, is that what a housewife does? I'm just going shopping for clothes, lunch is ready to be microwaved, and I'll be back before dinner. You should be the one to serve meals, being a housewife and all, living off the money I make, you sure have it easy. Though I earn less than Tom as the CEO, I also work full time. I contribute to our living expenses, so I shouldn't be criticized for it. Moreover, when Tom took over the company from his mother, his inexperience caused some trouble with our business partners. And I was the one who went around apologizing for it. You were cute 10 years ago. Now, you've just worn out like an old rag. Lately, he's taken to picking on my appearance whenever he can. You're a failure as a wife since you couldn't produce an heir. I'm only keeping you around out of pity. Be grateful. I wanted kids too, but it wasn't meant to be. How about we see a doctor? There might still be time. When I suggest this, Tom shakes his head. I don't want to waste extra money on that. It's obviously your fault. I'll forgive you since you're good at your job. When I get frustrated, I meet up with my best friend, Arya, and vent to her. Since we've been friends in college, she knows Tom well and sympathizes with me. Tom puts on a good face in public, but then he takes out his frustrations on you at home. He is hopeless, isn't he? Arya frowned, resting her chin on her hand. Remember how he used to come crying, wondering what to do? Does he think he's the only one who's grown the company? Maybe he's forgotten where he started. I muttered. There was support from Mill and the other executives, but I worked hard too. Thanks, Arya, I feel a lot better now. As I thanked her, Arya responded with a bright smile. I'm always on your side, Maria. Whenever something comes up, just let me know. I'm here to help. Arya's supportive words lifted my spirits somewhat. Lately, Tom's behavior has been visibly strange. Claiming social engagements, he spends most weekends out. Even on weekdays, he doesn't come home until after midnight. Yet, he never seems tired, instead always looking like he's having a good time. One evening, after finishing the housework, I was reading in the living room. Today, Tom left in the morning without saying where he was going. I expected his return to be late at night. Then, unusually, he came home just after 8 p.m. Tom entered the living room, his cheeks flushed with excitement he could hardly contain. Welcome back, you're home early today. Maria, you're gonna be glad. What? Why? I'm going to have a child. I blinked in disbelief. Excuse me. I got a 29-year-old beautiful employee pregnant. Please, let's get a divorce. I stared at Tom, taken aback by the suddenness of it all. Struggling to process what I had just heard. 
So, I'm finally going to be a dad, finally, an heir. My mom would be thrilled. Wait a minute, you've been cheating me. When I asked in shock, Tan nonchalantly replied. You know, Emily, from accounting. Yes, I know her well, she's pretty. Right, beautiful and has a great figure, and she's still in her 20s. Plus, she is competent at her job. Young women are just better. Excuse me. Though it was the first I heard of Emily being competent at her job. So, that means you are no longer needed. Let's get divorced. His blunt statement left me fuming. Over these 10 years, my dissatisfaction with Tom had accumulated leaving me with no attachment to our marriage. But I am not so good-natured as to say, yes, I understand, in reply. If he had been cheating, then I needed to get a substantial settlement from both of them. Being put on the spot like this is troubling. Could you invite Emily over? Let's have a discussion, the three of us. At this, Tom's voice perked up. I understood. I'll let her know. Watching Tom's happy stride towards the shower, I closed my book. I went upstairs to the bedroom and lay down on my bed, overwhelmed by a sense of emptiness. Overwhelmed by a sense of emptiness. More than the shock of being cheated on, I was devastated by the fact that he had gotten someone else pregnant. Tom had always wanted a successor. Of course, just because he wanted it didn't guarantee a boy. But before that, I couldn't become pregnant. If Emily was, then it implied the issue was with me. I wondered if we would have been happily raising a child together by now, if I had been able to conceive. I thought I had no love for Tom anymore, but I couldn't stop crying. The next day, I arrived at work early, my eyes swollen. I made myself a coffee to wake up. As I was about to step out into the hallway, I overheard Tom and Emily's conversation through the door. Was she shocked? Yeah, she looked completely stunned. Really, she hadn't noticed the affair. That's hilarious. It's been going on for two years. Emily giggled. Why didn't you dump her earlier, Tom? A woman who can even bear a successor? She's useful like a maid, you know. Plus, she is good at her job. If we divorced, she'd probably quit due to the awkwardness, right? Then why not keep her around? You can always dump her later. Once the baby is born, you can make her take care of it since it's the CEO's child. Tom was impressed by this outrageous suggestion. You're smart, Emily. She's a middle-aged woman. So, she probably knows a thing or two about parenting well. If it's for the kid's sake, she'll probably listen. Their laughter at such a cruel plan clenched my fists in anger. Their time to laugh and belittle me was limited. I'll make sure they regret underestimating me. After making all the necessary preparations, I informed Tom two weeks later to invite Emily over to our house. On the evening of the day, Emily arrived as if she was visiting a friend's house. Sorry for intruding. Wow, Tom's house is really lovely. I've always wanted to come here. Her eyes sparkled with excitement as Tom arrogantly declared. You should have said so earlier. I would have had her cook and entertain you. Ignoring my frown, Emily curiously looked around the interior, wandering around as if she owned the place. The kitchen is so spacious and stylish. 
It's nothing like my small apartment. Your place was cute too. It had that young woman's touch. Are you sure, Tom? Can I see the other rooms too? Tom, grinning, agreed to her presumptuous request and led the way. This is the study room, and next to it is the sunroom. I wish I had a sunroom. Oh, there aren't many houseplants. Such a waste of a spacious area. Is this Maria's preference? Emily criticized the space with a glass table, an indoor hammock, and just two potted plants. This woman, supposed to be here to apologize for the affair, is finding fault with my home's interior. What kind of person does that? No sane person would suggest having the company the CEO's wife raise their child. Well, no way, impossible. Maria isn't as gentle as you. She kills flowers immediately. A plants must hate her. That's so sad for Maria. As the two laughed, I bluntly interjected. You're here for a discussion, right? Let's have a seat at the table and get to it. Waiting for Tom and Emily to sit across from me at the table, I began. Let's confirm once more. Emily, you're pregnant with Tom's child, correct? Both nodded. Maria, I'm sorry, but this is fate. Emily's eyes teared up as she looked at me with a pleading gesture. Her familiarity grated on my nerves. This baby coming to me means that Tom and I were destined to be together in a past life. Marrying Maria was the mistake. We need to correct this mistake and start over or both Maria and Tom will be unhappy. I love you both too much to let that happen. I couldn't help but smirk at Emily's absurd logic. The extent of their self-justification was so appalling that I was left speechless. I truly love Tom from the bottom of my heart. So please, let me have Tom's child. I beg you. Emily's syrupy plea was met with Tom sniffling. He was moved to tears. I love Emily too. It would be pitiful for our child to grow up without a father especially since it's going to be the heir to Johnson industry. We need to raise it with care, together as its parents. Their clingy display and earnest appeals only served to deepen my disillusionment. Any residual affection I had for Tom was now completely extinguished. I had no desire to continue as his wife. I am okay but I'm quitting my job. What? Keep working, though. Tom frowned. At your age, quitting now would make it hard to find another job. Considering your contributions, we can keep you on here. I don't think so. I have qualifications in management. I'm sure I can find something else. Tom, you are so kind. If the CEO says so, Maria, you should stay. It doesn't bother me at all. I sighed at Emily's grinning face. That's impossible, because this woman. I paused for effect before dropping the bombshell. She has been embezzling company funds. What? What are you saying? Emily's eyes widened before she quickly looked away, her gaze falling awkwardly to the floor. What did you say? Tom showed a sudden panic. I kindly explained. This woman has been pocketing money meant for entertainment and travel expenses. She's been filling out blank receipts with her own amounts. As Tom's face paled, I continued in a calm tone. Nobody noticed for two years except for me, 
It only came to light after I conducted some interviews with related parties recently. I sighed heavily. Considering it's a family business, I thought it's time to cut ties. The thought of seeing your faces after the divorce disgusts me, so I'll be looking for a job elsewhere. Stop casting weird suspicions, please. Emily protested, her face contorted in discomfort. Where's the evidence for such a claim? The accounting manager you were cheating on threw up everything when the managing director asked. As I reached for my phone, Emily covered her face with her hands and burst into tears. I'm sorry. Actually, my father's company went bankrupt. My mother fell ill with an incurable disease and was hospitalized. My brothers rebelled against such parents, made debts, and disappeared. My salary alone wasn't enough. I just ended up doing it. Whether she had eye drops prepared or not, Emily cried violently. Tom, easily deceived, consoled Emily, deeply moved. That stuff. You should have told me. I didn't want to trouble you, Tom. All the money went to paying off debts. I can't pay it back. Tom seemed to believe her transparent lie. She must have spent all the money herself. What are you saying? Don't be so formal. Crying too much might affect the baby. How much was it? It's $20,000. And of course, I expect it all back. Depending on your attitude, I might even press charges for embezzlement. That much, we can cover. Who knows about this? The whole board. I'll keep them quiet. Emily, don't do it again. Yes, I won't. Thank you. I was disgusted by Tom stroking Emily's head. It is hard to believe the CEO's attitude. It felt like watching a poorly acted romance drama, making me nauseous. I suppressed my nausea and continued as planned. So, Emily working part-time at a hostess bar was also to help your family. Tom showed a flicker of disturbance at my words, but quickly pretended it was nothing. Our company doesn't prohibit part-time jobs. I wish you should have told me about it. I'm really sorry. Emily's face stiffened, a detail I didn't miss. Smiling, I laid out the photos I had acquired on the living room table. Stuff like this seems harmful to the baby, honestly questionable, but if it's Emily's decision, there's nothing I can do. Emily's expression changed instantly. She snatched the photos from the table. That was. Shots with her clients. Tom, you wouldn't want to see this. Emily answered with a forced smile but I laid out different photos in front of Tom. He gasped. Understandably, since the photos showed Emily arm in arm with various men happily entering hotels. Emily scrambled to gather the photos that suggested she had intimate relations with multiple men, but it was too late. Emily frantically tried to explain, as Tom was at a loss for words. It's not what it looks like. I felt sick during off-site dates and entered to rest. I didn't do anything shady. Believe me, Tom. She pleaded with sparkling eyes, but even Tom was visibly shocked. Is that so? Ah, uh, you don't believe me, Tom. That's so mean. You're the only one for me. Emily's feverish appeal to cling to Tom only made him display a bitter expression. I sighed heavily and stood up. 
retrieving my private laptop from the bedroom, and plugging in a USB I had received from a detective agency to play the damning audio evidence. Tom cried out in distress as the room filled with indiscreet sounds. Stop it! Stop it right now! The walls of hotels are surprisingly thin, aren't they? Seems like it's easy to record through them. I wonder if it's the technology or the equipment that's impressive. Emily, looking demonic, lashed out at me as she approached. You shameless woman. Are you going to these lengths just to break us up? You don't care about Tom's feelings at all. It's fine for you to hurt him. I'm merely exposing the truth. The one who hurt Tom is you, isn't it? And are you really pregnant? Or do you want the status of being the CEO's wife? It's different. My stomach will start showing soon. It's definitely Tom's child. With those photos, you can be sure whose it is. A mother's intuition. Did you say it is intuition, huh? I couldn't help but laugh at her audacity. Emily, getting in my face and shouting back, insisted. I wasn't serious with those guys. They were just for fun. The only one I truly love is Tom. I am sorry, but I can't understand Emily's logic. I shrugged in resignation and turned to Tom. What about you, Tom? Even if the child looks nothing like you, are you planning to raise it as your heir? That's... I don't know what to say. Not expecting him to hesitate, I threw in a sarcastic comment. So, any boy will do, even if he's someone else's, just like a cuckoo. What? It's my blood, not someone else's. And what right does a woman who can't even get pregnant have to talk? Emily exploded in anger. You know, you've always acted so high and mighty, despite being so unattractive. Ever since I joined the company, I hated you. Just because you're good at your job, you think you can boss everyone around. Blaring and ranting in fury, she continued. Telling male employees not to flirt, advising against seducing bosses. You are so annoying. As Emily ranted vulgarly, confident in her tirade. You're jealous of me because you're ugly, aren't you? You must have thought you were a winner when you married the CEO, but you are loser now. Emily laughed in a high voice. Hey, that's enough. As Emily ranted vulgarly, confident in her tirade, Tom seemed dismayed. Trying to calm her, Tom pulled at Emily's sleeve, but she was too heated to stop. You can't bear children, and you are not even pretty. In the past, you'd have been divorced long ago. Lucky for you, that's only because Tom's too kind. You're a defective product, kept out of pity. But that's over now. Hand over the position of the CEO's wife to me and go back to being a lonely old hag. Ignoring Emily's insults became tedious, and as I tuned her out, the living room door opened. Tom turned pale at the sight of the newcomer. What? Mom? Ah, uh, the chairwoman. Perfect timing. Emily brightened up standing to greet to my mill. Nice to meet you, Mill. I'm Emily from accounting. I'm carrying Tom's child. It's surely a boy. Since I'm pregnant with the ear, Tom and I will be getting married. My mill, with a look of exasperation, massaged her temples. Sighing deeply, she spoke in a low voice. Tom. Can you get this flighty woman to be quiet for a moment? Emily froze at Mill's harsh words. Looking at Emily as if she were trash, my Mill scolded Tom sharply. 
Only Maria has the right to call me Mill. Tom, it's because you're so absent-minded that weirdos can take advantage of you. Emily showed confusion but managed a stiff smile. Well, I mean, the chairwoman. I am carrying Tom's child, a boy, according to a mother's intuition. Unlike incompetent Maria, I'll give birth to a wordy heir for the company's future. We do need a child, right? However, my mill twisted her face in disgust and retorted. I don't care if it's a grandson or granddaughter. Wanting to be the CEO's wife after embezzling company funds. Are you sane? But, Mom, Emily has complicated family circumstances. Can't we overlook it just this once? My mill responded with a half laugh. You foolish boy. You really believe that excuse. Tom's face fell in shame as he looked at the documents my mill placed on the table. Mill, you also had a private investigator check Emily's background. Ah, uh, I see. I chuckled as I read the documents. Her parents work for a major corporation, and her brother is studying abroad. Her family is much wealthier than mine, so the embezzled money was for her personal use. Tom looked at Emily next to him, with disbelief. Pictures of her shopping extensively at brand stores have been taken. You're in debt because of credit card payments, right? My mill sneered through her nose. Also, this woman's obstetrics and gynecology is run by an acquaintance of mine. After I explained the situation, they let me know she's not pregnant at all. What? She's been going there for irregular periods, right? Emily turned bright red as my mill grinned wickedly. Bitch, don't give away my personal information. Sure, sure. Anyway, be prepared because we're pressing charges for embezzlement. Please proceed with the preparations, Aria. Yes, I understood, madam. I smiled at Arya, who appeared behind the chairwoman. Indeed, my best friend Arya is the company's legal counsel. When Emily's embezzlement came to light, I informed my mole and immediately consulted Arya. This was all while calculating the best moment to confront the situation, just as Tom was pressing me for a divorce. I'm so sorry for lying about being pregnant, but my love for Tom is real. Please believe me. Emily's tearful plea softened Tom's expression. Emily. That's right. Tom, you're being dismissed as the CEO for your irresponsibility in this affair. Tom and Emily gasped. Come on, just for an affair. You had an affair with a woman who embezzled. It's only natural. Not a single executive is on your side. This can't be happening. Tom began to shake, covering his face with his hands. Tom was good at entertaining clients, remembered well by other company the CEOs, which is why we kept this good for nothing around. My mill continued in a stern voice. But neglecting Moria, who contributed to the company, for a brainless young woman, a son like that is frankly unnecessary. Why? Fired? Please, spare me. I was deceived by Emily. Tom's voice sounded close to tears. Mom, I was wrong. It was just a moment of folly. I'll break up with Emily. Just keep me at the company. It's impossible to find another job at my age. Tom's pathetic plea to his mother made Emily seem disenchanted. What? After all that doting on me, to turn around just because mom says so? 
the worst. Emily glared, her disappointment palpable. I only cozied up to you because you were the CEO. If you were just a regular employee, a greasy old man 15 years my senior, I wouldn't have given you the time of day. What? You said you fell for me without caring about my title. This lying woman. Believing such nonsense, you're so gullible. That's why you got fooled by me. At Emily's words, Mimel shook her head in disgust. Both of you are as bad as each other. In that sense, you're well matched. Then the doorbell rang. Checking the front door monitor, there stood a police officer. Out of consideration for the neighbors, they had arrived in a patrol car without the siren. Emily, not expecting to be actually arrested, showed her panic. She even started flirting with the police officer who entered the room. Please listen to me, officer. I was deceived by the accounting manager. We'll hear your story at the station. Please come with us. Dismissed coldly, Emily clicked her tongue and was taken away in the patrol car. Tom, watching her being taken away from the doorway, staggered back to the sofa and slumped down in defeat. That same day, it seemed the co-conspirator, the accounting manager, was also arrested. However, since both were first-time offenders, they were quickly released. Emily, having spent all her money, had no savings and had to take out loans to repay the embezzled funds and my compensation. Naturally fired from the company, she began working multiple part-time jobs, including her previous job at a night hostess bar. She had to work day and night, weekends and days, and it seemed that she couldn't take care of her appearance. She looked haggard and worn when I saw her on the street recently, a far cry from the beautiful employee she once was. Meanwhile, Tom, spared from being fired, thanks to his mother's mercy, was transferred to a regional branch after our divorce. The details of his dismissal as the CEO spread among the employees, leading to him being ostracized and working in a hostile environment. Disowned by his mother and having spent all his savings on my alimony, Tom came to me, begging for reconciliation. Maria, I was wrong. Let's start over. I won't cheat again. Your ex-husband is struggling financially. You wouldn't abandon me, right? Why don't you ask the young girl you love so much to support you? You still have a job, even if the pay isn't great, so work hard. After scolding him over the phone and blocking his contact, he seemed to finally give up. According to Mimil, Tom's once bright personality is nowhere to be found. He spends his days without speaking to anyone, completing his tasks, and locks himself away in his room on his days off. Tom's cousin, who had been the vice the CEO, took over as the CEO in his stead. Recognized for my past achievements, I was promoted to a director on the board. The new CEO, though not much of a talker, is sincere and well-liked by the staff. My work has become busier, but my days are fulfilling. Though divorced from Tom, I occasionally have meals with my ex-husband's mother. Despite her position as the chairwoman, she never pressured me about producing an heir. This ordeal has deepened my respect for her character. Even though my ties with Tom are severed, I hope to maintain a close mentor-mentee relationship with the chairwoman, appreciating her as a senior figure in life.